Hey, it's Coach Taylor from SmarterTeamTraining.com. I'm going to walk you through a little bit of a, a scenario so you understand how this this episode on the radio show started. Uh, I reached out to a, a gentleman who I read a book, uh, and, and to be very fair, I just sent him an email and said, hey, I'm really interested in some of the things you get written in this book, and I'm curious to know if you wouldn't mind just talking to him shop and, and uh, uh, potentially sharing some information on the radio show with me. So Dan Trink is on the phone here with me. I have never met Dan. Dan has never met me. I honestly read his book, sent him an email. We went back and forth a couple times and said, let's do this. So you're going to hear a genuine a conversation between two professionals in the field just talking shop for very first time. And, and as Dan and I actually talked about a little bit before the show here, I want to see more professionals doing this, man, picking the phone up, sending an email, just connecting to find out what has worked for others so we can enhance our own product and enhance the experience of our clients and athletes in our own uh, uh, gyms, facilities, practices, et cetera. So, Dan, man, I, I appreciate you taking some time out of your day. Uh, I look forward to uh, an awesome conversation, and I'm just happy to meet you, my man. Yeah, man, I'm happy to meet you, too, and I appreciate you having me on. Dan, before we get started with the show, and, I, again, I have a bunch of questions for you already ready on my end, so uh, I, I want to know a little bit about you. I've, I've gone on your website. I've read a little bit about what you got going on. Obviously, I read your book. I, I know I've checked your stuff out on Facebook and some of the other social media outlets, uh, but I want to know about you as a person, man, as far as the passion goes. I mean, where does your passion come from for the field? Uh, I mean, what really gets you started, uh, you know, gets you, gets you up and gets you, gets, you, gets you pumped for the day kind of scenario? And just tell me a little bit about what you got going on now, man. I was always passionate, uh, was always, you know, kind of big into fitness and sports as a kid. And, um, you know, I kind of lost my way on that when I was in my uh, mid-20s and uh, found myself quite overweight and uh, out of shape and, uh, stop doing the physical things that were important to me, like I think happens to a lot of people. Uh, like I said, in my late 20s, I kind of found, found my way back to it and uh, more than reignited my passion for it, it, it kind of dialed my passion way up for it uh, to the point where uh, I was in a corporate job and I was spending more time, you know, reading T Nation and uh, old Russian training manuals than I was uh, focusing on my work. So uh, that eventually led me to... Uh, to jump ship and uh, go into fitness uh, full time, um, and that kind of fire and passion, uh, particularly for fitness for myself um, and learning about it through experts and people that I admired, has kind of never gone away. Like most good coaches, I still have this quest for knowledge and uh, the desire to help people. And I think, given that that was my background and so many other people, once they stop, uh, you know, doing athletics in high school or even in college and, and get out into, quote, unquote, the real world, um, kind of lose that part of their life or think there's no room for it anymore. And, you know, I get uh, pretty fired up about getting people back to that, um, figuring out their inner athlete, uh, their inner sportsman, and um, helping them achieve goals and both inner and outer strength that they may have lost or never even thought they had. So that's kind of what gets me uh, fired up and out of bed at 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, training clients. For the listeners that are that are interested here, the, if you go to humankinetics.com and just search High Intensity 300 or, or even just search, um, I'm sure, Dan Trink, uh, T-R-I-N-K, you can see the book and the title and, and kind of see what we're talking about. Uh, I know I got a chance to read through this book and, and – uh, I think it's awesome. You outlined like literally a billion workouts. I feel like there's 800 different variations of, of the 300 that you've already included in there uh, with a whole bunch of different opportunities for several other uh, you know, avenues to just generate an endless number of um, uh, modalities, we'll call it. I mean, just just a lot of fun. I, I just, I'm going through that just thinking about all the things that we can do with it. It was a lot of, a lot of fun to see what we can add to our program and, and just to see what other people are doing differently. I mean, I have a couple questions when I, as I was reading it and writing down my own notes. I mean, Specifically, when you're designing training programs, how do you differentiate between metabolic conditioning, uh, strength training, sports performance, uh, uh, the the uh, the high intensity interval craves? Uh, you know, the, the, there's a bunch of different things there, catch words there, and uh, if we, to name one, you have to name them all. But uh, hopefully, you can stick with me here. I mean, how do you differentiate between um, the, the, those categories, if you wouldn't mind, when you're designing your programs? Yeah. Well, first of all, I appreciate you uh, you mentioning the word fun. Because uh, yeah, obviously in the writing style of the book, but also in the workouts, um, I really tried to keep them fun and engaging. And I think that's something that uh, you know we tend to lose when we uh, get into you know more hardcore, serious training. We think it's all about 
you know, the work. And, and of course it is, but the fact that we can keep a little bit fun in, in uh, fitness, I think, is important, um, even while we're training hard and, and trying to reach our goals. Um, how do I differentiate between all, all these strength qualities? Well, I think there's more carryover than people give them credit for. I think we, uh, we get wrapped up kind of in uh, certain rep ranges equals certain strength qualities or certain types of apparatus. You know, a prowler equals metabolic conditioning and a two-rep squat equals maximal strength. And I think all those things are obviously true. Um, but I think there's definitely carryover of, like, you know, for instance, I'll give you an example of a workout in the book. There's a workout in the book that's a two-rep front squat, but it's every minute on the minute, and you're adding five pounds every minute. If you think that those two reps after a while, after you get to minute 20, and, you know, you've added, four, you know, uh, 100 pounds to your front squat and you're still trying to bang out reps, if you think that's not metabolic as well, you know, you're kidding yourself um, because you'll be out of gas from, you know, just two reps. So I think there's definitely a lot of carryover. And I think for most people, obviously, if you're a power lifter or a bodybuilder, you're going to want to specialize in certain things um, to either drive up your one rep max or to promote maximal hypertrophy. And I think those avenues are um, kind of well-trotted ground um, and very effective, and they work. But I think for 95% of the population who's interested in fitness um, and even achieving, you know, better performance, better body composition, straddling the line of, of all different kinds of strength qualities and doing uh, training blocks that involve strength and doing training blocks that involve mass building and doing training blocks that are a little bit more metabolic and heart rate driven, I think kind of combining that into an overall fitness plan uh, just tends to make a little bit more, uh, more sense to people. Now, that doesn't mean you just do it willy-nilly and like one day I'm going to do hypertrophy, one day I'm going to do strength. I think there's still you know, value in, in breaking it up into certain training blocks and having different focuses. But you know, most people don't necessarily need to specialize so much, and I think that's kind of one of the great things about the book is you're getting a lot of variety. Uh, like you said, there's 300 workouts, but there's ramped-up versions of some workouts, and there's you know, back-off versions of all the workouts. And you can get, get kind of a really good sense of like, hey, I want an interesting strength training program. I'm going to the strength chapter, and I'm going to do that. Or, you know what, I'm just you know, I'm all about fat loss because i got to get to the beach, so I'm going to hit those 40 workouts that are in the fat loss chapter. So, you know, do I think those differentiations are important for people? Sure, but I think, you know, a lot of people just have to or would like to kind of cover the general um, scope of fitness, you know, especially if you're looking long-term throughout their their year. I like the idea that you have set up in the book here as far as templating workouts and having some type of plan. I don't think a lot of people write down kind of where they're at, where they're going to, going to be, and then kind of that route to get from A to B. I mean, when you template a workout, I mean, how much freedom do you give to the trainees to select other exercises within the scope of your program? But listen, I want people, and I you know say this in the introduction of the book, I want I want it to work for them, right? I'm not you know, I'm not the end-all, be-all, and I'm certainly not ego-driven thinking that, you know, every exercise that I write down is the right one for every person. Right? It just doesn't work that way. So the book is a guide, I think, for people who don't understand training or who just aren't necessarily into the background and the theory of training, who just want to pick up something practical and do it. I think it lays out, uh, you know, really good training programs that you can do um, pretty easily in most gyms. If you are, uh, you know, if you have a great background and you have specific goals and there's, uh, you know, if my gym doesn't have a trap bar and I want to use a straight bar instead, of course, there's always leeway to do those things. Um, you know, I want everybody to get the most out of it that they can. So, uh, you know, I think be smart. Don't just, just, don't just trade out things willy-nilly. And I tried to uh, keep things within the realm of, you know, exercise science, exercise science and best practices, meaning like I'm not having you do super high reps of a movement that's not designed for super high reps. I mean, I think things like that are important to me. Um, so hopefully the reader has an understanding of, of what those things are and doesn't make substitutions like that. But, yeah, man, get out of the book whatever you want. If you're looking to drive up your deadlift or, you know, you saw a front squat program that you think like, oh, you know what, I think this would work better for me for the back squat, then definitely do it. Oftentimes I sit down with my staff and they see a, a book and they write the workout on the board or whatever and they take their own interpretation out and 
sometimes I feel like they just in, assume that that recipe, that magic formula that's on the board is going to produce results. And I always go back and reinforce the value of relationships. Uh, how do you develop relationships in your own business as far as how you train clients, uh, developing that trust, the communication, uh, et cetera, with the people that you train? I mean, how, mu- how much value do you place on the relationship of, between you and the individuals that you get a chance to work with? Well, I think the relationship is everything. Uh, I think within the industry, uh, between guys like you and I, um, and between me and my uh, clients that I see on a daily basis, and even the people who pick up the book and read it who've never met me before and never will meet me. Um, you know, it's a, it, it is asking someone a lot to step out of their comfort zone. It's asking a lot to ask uh, to put a, you know, a uh, several hundred par- pound bar on your back in certain occasions, and I'm telling you that you can do something that uh, you yourself maybe or maybe do not believe that you can do. So developing that trust is uh, is critical to getting results um, and having a healthy working relationship with someone. And I think that develops a few ways. I think it develops over time. Uh, you know, people are in front of you day in and day out and, uh, you know, believe in you and see that you have their best interests in heart and see your passion for what you're doing um, and know that you're not you know, just doing this to make a, a buck for an hour before you go do your real job, uh, you know, I think that comes through. And I also think uh, the trust is developed in how you carry yourself as a professional. Um, you know, are you continuing to educate yourself? Are you educating your clients? Are you keeping up on the latest and greatest stuff? Are you surrounding yourself with other fitness professionals and, and reading the latest research and, you know, walking the walk yourself. Are you training? Are you eating the right way? I think all those things go uh, go miles and miles for people um, in believing in you and you getting more out of them than they think they can get out of themselves. You brought up the uh, concept of beach season and getting leaner, my man. So I'm going to go down that road if you wouldn't mind. Uh, since writing the book, I'm sure there's been hundreds of people that have reached out to you to ask questions or even just more information to come across your desk and you get a chance to just learn more and become more knowledgeable about the topic. I mean, what advice would you have for clients wanting to get leaner and lose body fat now, even since you've written the book? I think the hard part, but yet the most critical part, uh, if that's your goal, is to really get a solid nutrition plan in check. Um, I discuss nutrition in the book, but it's, it's more of a side note. I wasn't really writing a diet book. Um, I'm not even sure I believe in diet books all that much. But, uh, you know, I mentioned just the basics. But for, leaner, for you know, getting leaner, fat loss in particular, those goals seem to be very nutrition-driven. So I would say either develop a plan or work with someone um, to develop a really solid nutrition plan that works for you, which means if you go out three nights a week uh, to eat dinner, you know, that has to be part of your plan. And if you have three kids and you're cooking meals every night and you need something that works for you and works for your kids, that has to be part of your plan. So the, the cookie cutter stuff, you know, doesn't necessarily work for everyone. And there's, there's tons of different options that, that, you know, can get you there. If it's low carb, uh, high protein, or, you know, something more like the zone, all those things can work if they work for you. So I think that's number one. I think uh, number two from in my experience, if you know your nutrition is is in place and the other recovery factors are in place, meaning you're le- leading a fairly low stress life, uh, you're getting ample amounts of sleep. I actually think training um, at a higher frequency than maybe uh, is in the public consciousness um, might be a good idea. So, for example, in the book, you know I have 300 uh, training programs that's supposed to be done over a 365 day period. Uh, you know, that's the recommendation. That leaves one or two rest days uh, per week, which is much less than most people take. But the programs are designed with that in mind. So, you know, if, you're, if your recovery strategies are in place correctly, your nutritional strategies are in place uh, correctly, if the training program is of the intensity and length where you can recover and come back the next day, I think if you can put all those factors in place, you kind of can't help but improve body composition. It just seems to happen. Obviously, with the title of the book being High Intensity 300, uh, I initially go right to the concept of how do you monitor load 
And then as I started reading through things, I started seeing the concept and what I would consider metabolic conditioning in some of the some of the workouts. And so I, I was always curious to know how other professionals would treat the two of those types of questions. I mean, how do you monitor load when incorporating metabolic conditioning into a program? Uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I think you hear high intensity and you think about really, you know, 300 um, workouts that base that are based on. Uh, you know, heart rate-based training or really fast-paced training. And that's, even though the workouts are short, that's not, you know, 100% uh, what the book's about. You know, there's strength training blocks, there's hypertrophy blocks. Um, so it's not all go, go, go. Obviously, if you're doing metabolic conditioning uh, with resistance, you know, that has to be kept in mind that the resistance adds, you know, a significant, you know, adds significant impact uh, to what you can recover from and stress on your body. So I think, uh, you know, like you're saying, that definitely has to be monitored and accounted for. Um, In the book, I make some recommendations based on body weight, like percentage of body weight uh, should be on the barbell, or I might even give you uh, specific weights that should be placed on the barbell. Um, But again, I think it's a little bit of if you have some training experience, you should know know generally what your capabilities are. Um, and hopefully scale up or scale down based on that. Um, and in the kind of stepping it up versions of each workout or the easy does it versions of each workout, um, a lot of times that's what I am kind of dialing up or dialing down is is the resistance or the weight on the bar. Um, but uh, I try to do a pretty good job of giving you some guidelines based on how big you are, how strong you are, uh, percentage either uh, weight based on body weight or weights based off of one rep max um, to kind of give you a good idea of what types of load you you should use and then adjust from there. Go through one round, let's say it's a five round circuit, go through one, one round and see like, hey, you know what, I could have added more weight there or um, I need to back off here. Um, and, you know, usually your form and your body will tell you, uh, you know, if you're in the ballpark or if, or if you need to adjust accordingly. You brought up the concept of recovery, and and we harp on the concept of eating, sleeping, and hydrating, and then the value of that uh, maybe even that may even supersede all the stuff that you do in the weight room or on the conditioning side of of what our field does. I mean, what recommendations do you have for recovery uh, for for your athletes or or for clients in, in general? I mean, is there a different approach that you take for people who are extremely active and very fit? Is there a uh, a different approach you take for someone who's just getting up and getting started into a program? I mean, how do you kind of walk it through in, in the application aspect of, of what you're reading and seeing? Well, I think recovery, just like nutrition and just like training, needs to be individualized. Um, everybody has their own set of circumstances, uh, and those need to be accounted for. So you can make some general recovery strategies, um, but really at the end of the day, if someone, you know, is 22 years old and uh, is independently wealthy and basically is all about training and can come in four days a week and then do any kind of recovery that I need them to. And, uh, you know, that person obviously gets a different prescription than someone who's like, you know, maybe I can fit in five minutes of foam rolling before I go to bed. So I think both the training program and the recovery strategies have to be individualized. You know, with that being said, the things that I focus on mainly, number one, nutrition. I think food uh, is really underappreciated as a as a recovery tool. Um, and along with sleep, which would be my number two, are probably the big one-two punch of recovery, getting adequate sleep um, and getting good quality sleep. So good quality nutrition, uh, ample nutrition, and good quality sleep, I think, are the big ones. I think everything else uh, kind of comes secondarily. Uh, and it depends how deep somebody wants to go. You know, so our supplements can work for some people. Uh, saunas, cold plunges, things like that can be great. Um, you know, heart rate monitoring, temperature monitoring in the AMs. You know, it depends how deep somebody is willing to go and how important it is to them. But uh, given that I work and live in New York City um, and people are kind of living a go-go, high-stress lifestyle, uh, you know, recovery is huge for these people. And... Uh, and it's definitely something that take very seriously, particularly, uh, you know, with more adult or, you know, middle-aged populations. When you're putting the 300 workouts together for the book, and I'm also going to ask you a little about your own training program that you do with clients and athletes there with yourself, 
Uh, are there exercises that you either avoid or encourage when you design a program? It's again, it's specific. It's person to person. I don't think uh, there's any exercises that are uh, that are bad, and I don't think there's any exercises that are a magic pill for everyone. Um, you know, if someone has no desire to be good at weightlifting, uh, is teaching them snatch and clean and jerk the best use of their time? Probably not. You could probably develop power somewhere else. So. It really depends on what the needs of the individual are. Um, but I do get people, you know, it, it's kind of ironic because there's, you know, 300 workouts in the book. Each one features a different exercise, so there's a huge amount of variety, which was important to us when uh, when we wrote the book. But, you know, I'm really, you know, in person I'm a pretty meat and potatoes uh, type trainer, and I don't tend to use a ton of exercises there'll be, you know, variations on the main theme. So I try to get people squatting and deadlifting, um, you know, pressing if their shoulders can take it, pull-ups, lunges, and all, you know, all the main movement patterns that, you know, everybody listening to knows and, and I'm sure incorporates into their training programs. So, uh, you know, I try and get clients doing that all the time. I'm also at a facility, luckily enough, that we have some modified strongman equipment, and I think... You know, getting back to the fun aspect, I think people find that to be fun and engaging. So things like prowlers and sleds and sandbags and kettlebells, um, you know, keep things uh, interesting and engaging. And, you know, they're fairly low risk. They're fairly low learning curve, uh, particularly I'm talking about, like, prowlers and sleds. Uh, so to incorporate them, even with very beginning clients, is very easy. People find it engaging. Um, it's fun and it's really effective. So... You know, try to use all the tools that make sense in the gym, but keeping things fairly simple and basic. I don't necessarily know your client database there or the athletes, uh, the demographic that you get a chance to work with. So I want to ask a little bit of a, a broad question, and hopefully we can go down this road a little bit. But when you're training different levels of athletes, uh, and that could be chronological age or training age for that matter, uh, whether they're athletes or clients, that doesn't make a difference to me. Uh, how do you progress or regress their program? Uh, do you go through any special considerations in regards to uh, just how they learn? Uh, are you doing something visually as far as enhancing their maybe sending YouTube clips or pictures or um, maybe showing them yourself or having others people show them? Or Walk me through that process of how you're actually teaching uh, those people that are just learning and then progressing into your program. Every new client starts out with an assessment, right, some sort of movement assessment like an FMS or SFMA or something like that that either I'll perform or uh, somebody else here will perform and then give me that information. So at least we get a base of how someone moves. And then I'll take them through uh, kind of a low-stress workout, but with a lot of different movements, just to see how they handle the basic movement patterns and how they handle um, a little bit of external load. So I have that information um, in my brain before I even start developing their first training program. Uh, so I find that to be really helpful, and I think that's someone, something that everyone should do rather than just putting someone through uh, you know, workout X uh, that they have logged in their uh, in their notebook. Um, as far as uh, coaching and getting people good at the movements, yeah, I mean, it, it depends what it is. If it's something, you know, to harken back to uh, the Olympic lifts like I talked about before, if it's something like that, yeah, we might watch a ton of video of the guys who are great doing it um, just so you get an idea of the speed and the accuracy and the technique. Um, but for most people, I try to initially let them move the way that they move and then uh, adjust gradually with one or two uh, cues, usually like external cueing, um, that allows them to get into the movements a little better and just start tweaking from there. As long as someone's not at risk of getting injured, um, I don't want to overcoach or put too many thoughts in their mind or get them too uptight about uh, trying something they've never tried before. So uh, let them pick up the barbell, let it be, or, you know, or the kettlebell or whatever it may be, let it be low load, low risk, and, uh, you know, see if we can get it looking um, like it's supposed to. And if it's not and if it's too much for them and we need to regress to uh, an easier apparatus or something different, then we do that. And, you know, that happens from time to time. But most people, 
you know, respond to cueing pretty well. Um, some people are a little bit more visual than verbal, so you know, I might demonstrate a rep or two, or, or it might be all of it, depending on you know what the client's um, training experience is. So you know, again, nothing, no magical formula. It's just trying to talk through someone, uh, talk someone through uh, getting really good movement patterns, but without clogging their brain or making them too uptight. I like talking to other professionals in the field to find out how they're expanding their own knowledge base uh, and, and even incorporating their potentially their colleagues. I mean, a lot of trainers in, in the private sector are in, a, in an environment where they don't even communicate with other trainers within their own facility, and that could be an outstanding opportunity to learn from one another to enhance the entire facility's opportunity to make money and, and provide better service. I mean, how important is professional development for you and your staff uh, between the colleagues within your facility or, or within your community, for that matter? And how do you incorporate it into a busy week? Uh, I would say it's enormous, the importance and, uh, that we put on it. Um, that is, I would say, listen, the facility is beautiful and it's well-equipped. And like I said, we have some fun equipment and, uh, you know, people like to train hard here. And I think that... Uh, attitude and environment is very beneficial for our clients. But for us as trainers, being around other people who are really passionate about training, who go out and spend their weekends learning different modalities, uh, different corrective exercises, different recovery techniques, different nutritional strategies, whatever the idea ideology may be, um, and then us having an open discussion about it, I think is what sets great trainers apart from trainers. Um, we have a training room here, which is maybe an eight by eight room, and some of the best learning um, and continuing education I've ever gotten is just sitting in that room and hearing people discuss uh, what it is they've learned on their weekends or what they've read about, um, and five or six or ten of us having uh, a rousing discussion on what we think of it. So I think if you know for the uh, for the professional, I think finding an environment where that's the case uh, will make you much better as a trainer. It will uh, get you much more fired up about training because, you know, it can be a grind seeing client after client and trying to make uh, a living at this. And I think it, see, being around other people who are just as passionate as you are um, really helps light a fire. Um, and as a client, I think you want to train in an environment where that is what's happening, um, where professionals are going out seeking, you know, the latest and greatest um, and the best practices and are implementing them on the training floor. So I think both for, for client and for trainer, I think being in that kind of environment is invaluable and by too many people who are, who are just in it to kind of, you know, turnover sessions or just looking for a quick buck, I think, I think they're missing out in a huge way. And, and it's a really big part of, of the environment that I'm in. For the individual who's potentially interested in writing a book, for the, the professional that gets a chance to either read posts that you share on Facebook or social media as a whole, or the individual gets a chance to, to learn from you in person at potentially a, a clinic, an event, or even just sitting down and, and having a chat with you at a Starbucks, for that matter. I mean, what's one big passionate message you'd have for them uh, just to, to uh, motivate them and inspire them to achieve their own greatness? I, my big message, I think, that helps people is, is I actually think of the gym, and I'm always telling people, like, what you achieve in the gym is what allows you to achieve out, outside of the gym. Being strong in the gym is what makes you strong outside of the gym. So, and I see this proven all uh, over and over again with clients who are in companies that are going through huge layoffs that even as that's happening, they're getting promotions. Um, you know, the, 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 the skills and the mindset that you put into your training program, uh, whether you do it in a setting like I'm in or whether you do it on your own or in your garage or in a gym with your buddies or whatever the case may be, the lessons that you'll learn there and the strength that you develop uh, both physically and mentally in the gym will carry over to every other aspect of your life, whether that's work or your relationships or being a parent, or whatever else is important to you. And I think, to me, that is the actual secret and main benefit of training. Sure, there's health benefits, and there's athletic performance benefits, and, uh, you know, you can get a better beach body and all that other stuff, and that's great. And I think a lot of people walk into a gym with that being their goal. 
But I think once you experience that other side and how the you know lifestyle, to use the cliche aspect of it, um, really does carry over to everything else, I think that's where the magic happens, um, and that's where people achieve greatness, um, and that's where they you know get set on fire is from that. So to me, my main goal um, is to help people get to that point. Um, because then I know they'll be, you know, in fitness and dedicated to it uh, for the rest of their lives. Well, Dan, man, I know I appreciate the uh, the opportunity here to get a chance to talk to you again to the listeners on, uh, to, uh, that are listening to this show. Uh, it's two dudes that just sent an email back and forth, and it all predicated off the book, High Intensity 300. Uh, again, I, I don't get any money endorsements or anything like that, but I just wanted to tell Dan, thank you very much for putting a passion in, and uh, his thoughts and processes into that book. Uh, I, I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, as a resource, and it's, added, it's obviously added some value to my library uh, that we have, and we have probably five or 600 different books that we go through uh, with our interns and our staff regularly. So, um, Dan, and, uh, I, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time out of, uh, of uh, um, your obviously busy work life and, and, and general uh, li- living as a whole to write that thing, man. Uh, if anybody wanted to reach out to you to learn more about the book, or maybe they were stopping into New York City and they wanted to get a chance to meet you, uh, learn from you, potentially maybe even use you as a little bit of a mentor, I mean, how can they go about reaching out to you, my man? Yeah, so you could always uh, email me, dan at trinkfitness.com. That's one word, T-R-I-N-K, fitness.com. Um, and that's a great way to email me, and I'm always happy to uh, to respond to people and, and be in touch with other fitness professionals and any way I can help them out, uh, I'm more than happy to do so. And if you just want to kind of hear about what I've got going on and, and uh, other news, you can check me out on Facebook at Trink Fitness, um, on Twitter at Trink Fitness, or on Instagram as Dan Trink. So I do different things with, uh, with those different avenues. You know, Instagram's mostly if you want to see how I train and get after it. Uh, I post little videos on there quite regularly. Um, the Trink Fitness Facebook page is uh, kind of gives you an idea of, you know, I do a lot of training tips and just different ideas and, you know, link to articles I have on, you know, muscle and fitness and men's fitness and things like that. So if you want to follow me there. Um, and then Twitter is just, you know, little ideas here and there, whatever 140 characters allows. So uh, so check all those out. But uh, certainly feel free to email me. Again, I'm, I'm more than happy uh, to help out any other uh, pros or enthusiasts or, um, anyone else who uh, who thinks I can benefit them. Well, again, Dan, man, I know you're a very busy dude, and uh, I, I appreciate you taking some time out of your day. Uh, for the listeners, it's Friday, uh, the Friday of Halloween, actually, that we're doing this, and I know it's in the, right after, hopefully, the busy part of your day, and hopefully you get a chance to eat some lunch, my man, and then get back after it for the for the second surge here. But uh, uh, I appreciate, sincerely, you taking some time out of your day. Thank you very much for having a little bit of a Q&A back and forth. I took a bunch of notes, and I'm hopefully going to follow up with a, a bunch of questions uh, that I'll have even beyond this uh, this conversation, my man. So uh, hopefully this is a launch pad for us to do more things down the road here. Uh, when I'm in uh, New York City, big dog, I'm going to definitely look you up, and uh, hopefully all the listeners here shoot you an email and uh, learn more about that book because I think it's an outstanding resource. So thank you very much, my man. I look forward to keeping in touch, big dog. Oh, yeah, thank you. And, yeah, if you're around, definitely come down. We'll, uh, we'll push the prowler.